Hey folks, I wanted to do a short video because we've had some really interesting things happening in the last couple of days. I am working on a project for a client just down the street from me in our little hamlet here in Alberta. And we were doing a feasibility study, which is what we do on a regular basis, which helps people to understand the potentiality of their land. So we look at things like where water is moving across the landscape, how the climate interacts with the landscape, proximity to cities, where buildings should go, how to build roads, um, how to uh, plant specific types of trees and what types of trees to plant where. That's a, saying the same thing in different ways. And we go through fencing and fauna and flora and basically how to help our clients meet their energy, water, shelter requirements in a way that's beneficial to land. And one of the things that we typically do for our clients is we measure the radon. And so I used to put these little devices in for clients. This is an Air Things device. Um, they're a company out of, I think it's Norway. It's either Norway or Finland. And you can look them up and I'll put a link to them in the show notes down below. And these are radon detectors. They've got different air quality sensors that you can get for your house. And so I would implant these into people's homes. And this is connected to a smartphone typically. They're about 200 bucks. Uh, the problem is, is that with this one now, I've lent this out and somebody's connected it to their smartphone and I can't get it to connect to my smartphone. So I had to get a new radon detector. And so I did, and that's what's in this pot here. And I said, well, I just wanna, before I go and implant this into my client's device, I wanna measure my house. And I was thinking, you know, my house doesn't have a basement and I'm not gonna find anything. And so I just want to prove that there's no radon in my house. And if you're not familiar with radon, uh, it affects a lot of people in North America and probably globally as well. In fact, Air Things has a global radon map. And so you can kind of see radon hotspots all around the world. As they've started sending these devices out, they uh, typically are Bluetooth connected and they collect the data and they put it up onto a map, which is really interesting. And radon is actually the leading cause of lung cancer for people that do not smoke. So Michelle and I don't smoke and you know, it's just one of those things that is worth looking into. It's also odorless, it has no color. And so you could be living in a radon filled environment without even knowing it. So anyways, I threw this device, uh, I got a slightly different version of the Air Things device. This one actually has a digital readout into our house and I chucked it right up here and I didn't really think anything of it. And then I came down about a day later. And so this device has both a long-term average and a short-term average. And you really do need to measure it for 30 days to get a really accurate result. But you can start to get some clues, which are, I think the instructions say plus or minus 10%. So the short day average is plus or minus 10% and the long-term average is much, a much tighter level of precision. And there's different ranges on the device. So you can kind of see there, right here in this little chart. Um, anything under 100, you're probably okay in your home. Anything between 100 and 150, you probably need to ventilate. And anything above 150, you need to contact a uh, radon specialist. And so that's something that I would typically do. I would go into a house and design a heating or, or ventilation system, typically an HRV. Now, when we first moved into this house, we had an HRV installed fairly quickly because I didn't want to rely on bathroom fans and eventually potentially even take out our kitchen cooking fan. And it's nice to have fresh air. And so a, a heat recovery ventilator allows you to constantly move the air in your house, recover the heat, which you've paid for and bring fresh air in. So it's a cost effective way of not spending piles of energy to bring in fresh air all the time, but still get the benefit of fresh air. So we have an HRV and typically an HRV is going to solve any radon issues you have, even if you didn't know you had them. So in the back of my mind, since we put this HRV in, I haven't really worried about it. Plus we don't have a basement. And so a lot of the kind of key risk factors just didn't exist for us. And so when I saw that my radon meter was measuring 260, remember 150 is like a really bad range and above, I got kind of concerned. And so I've started kind of adding components now to my HRV. I haven't put them in yet, but I'm designing it so that I can increase ventilation. And so I'm going to, you know, ventilate the crawl space. I'm going to suck air out of it and get it out of my house. I'm going to probably create a negative air 
pressure in the crawl space so that the air in the house is generally moving down into the crawl space and out. So if the radon is coming from the exposed dirt in the crawl space, then the clean air in the house should be injected high up in the house and slowly move its way down to the crawl space. So I'm going to add some components to the ventilation system. I'm going to distribute fresh air into our bedroom so at night when we're sleeping we don't have radon. Like I'm doing some of those things. And then I, I ended up reading uh, the other day on a website because um, I was I wanted to learn more about radon. I know quite a bit about it but um, there's still something not working for me because I I was you know, it, it did, didn't make sense that the radon levels were this high in my house, in spite of not having a basement. And so I kind of went down the rabbit hole, and it turns out 50 million uh, North Americans have high radon levels in their house as a result of well water, which makes sense because you're bringing water in from really uh, low down on the earth. And so if you have parent material that has got uranium in it, which is where a lot of this radon comes from, it's basically a byproduct of uh, decaying small specks of uranium in the soil, um, there's a probability that that uranium will also be down at the water bearing level where you're pulling your well, out, well water out. And so I said, well, let's test that hypothesis. And so um, I put well water into uh, an Instapot bowl. I put a bowl on top of the water so that my device didn't get wet. And then I just chucked my device in right there and I put a lid over top of it overnight. Not super scientific, but trying to reduce the amount of air exchange happening between the pot and the, and the room. And I woke up this morning and my radon level was 711. This is the one day average. And the reason that the long term average is lower than the 250 I talked about is I also took this outside a couple of days ago. To, to, to make sure that my radon meter was actually measuring effectively. I wanted to take it outside, let it zero out to confirm that I'm not living in an area of Alberta that's just naturally got radon in the atmosphere. And it didn't zero out, but it got pretty close. And so I know the radon meter's working. Um, this guy here, if you look at him, sorry for the mess on the counter, if I put my hand over top of him, it gets red. Okay, so it's also reading an extremely high radon level. So it's telling me warning, warning, warning. So I have two meters now that are telling me the same thing. So 711 after 24 hours with a small amount of well water in there tells me that uh, probably a lot of the radon in this house is the result of our well water. So that's really interesting because when we're as designers and we're going to properties and we're looking at land use bylaw and municipal guidelines, there's this kind of unspoken belief that groundwater is safe. You know, it filters through all this rock and it cleans it up and it's got minerals in it and, and we kind of, we test it, we do a chemical and biological test typically and they're very, very narrow tests so they'll test for E. coli, but most people don't know this. There's more than one species of E. coli. There's something like 28 different genetic differences or genetic variations of E. coli. Only two of those actually cause issues in your gut. Um, but when we're doing our water test, we don't test for the genetic differences in the E. coli. We just test to see if there's E. coli present. So we don't know if we've got the toxic version or some other version of E. coli. Um, we check for different coliforms. We check for uh, uh, calcium. Um, and different minerals to determine the hardness of water and that usually dictates whether we put on a softener um, but we don't test for pesticides and herbicides. I just went down another rabbit hole around pesticides. Um, atrazine which is one of the most commonly used pesticides in agriculture uh, at 300 parts per million can turn a male toad into a female toad. When they put the, the, a toad into water with atrazine will actually change the sex of the animal. And so all of these products that uh, don't have taste, don't have color, um, that we've been either, like radon's naturally occurring, but pesticides and herbicides are man-made, all of these things eventually end up in our drinking water. And if we're not testing for them, then in our minds they don't exist, but that doesn't mean that we're not potentially doing ourselves harm. Interestingly enough, the people that sold us this house one of them had cancer when they were leaving and they were transitioning the house to us and it makes me wonder whether that cancer was a byproduct of living in a house for 20 years with radon gas. 
that they were unaware of because nobody told them to test it. So as a result of learning this, we've now lived in this house for close to three years. And this is super concerning to me because, um, you know, I've exposed my children to it. I've exposed my wife to it myself, um, you know, unbeknownst to me, like all of the signs were here that, you know, that didn't make me think about testing my own home. And now here we find ourselves in a situation where um, we've got to deal with this. And so the solution for radon in the water is a three to five thousand dollar carbon filtration system. Carbon, activated carbon can take out 99% of radon apparently, but you need a 10 to 15 minute residence time in order for that to work. Another solution is, is water aeration. And so you pump the water out of the ground, put it into a giant vessel, uh, aerate it, and then allow the um, air and the radon gas to basically volatilize off of the tank. But then you have to repressurize the water. So now you gotta pump it twice in order to get it into your house. Plus you've got this device that's constantly consuming energy in order for you to have clean water. And so as you might know, we've written a book on rainwater harvesting, which in some parts of the world is the primary source of high quality drinking water. Australia is one that comes to mind. And in other parts of the world, it's completely illegal. And I find that interesting because there is a ton of scientific literature, which we document in our book, Essential, essential to rainwater harvesting, which I'll put a link to in the show notes down below. There's a ton of scientific literature on why rainwater is safe and all the tests they've done. They've tested it for all sorts of crazy things like the biofilms that accumulate in a rainwater tank will bioremediate the lead and zinc and any other like heavy metals that might be present, even bacteria in a tank. So the tank actually becomes part of a treatment train. It, it becomes a biological reactor that actively cleans water out of your, uh, cleans the toxins out of your water. And we know how all these mechanisms work because we've tested this uh, extensively. I mean, I think in Australia, close to 5 million people drink rainwater on a daily basis without significant treatment. Significant treatment being um, high-end expensive filters, just using very simple methodologies to make sure that their water is safe. And, uh, and yet, you know, when we're looking at the use of rainwater here in Alberta, um, nobody really knows how to deal with it because everybody thinks that this water that's falling from the sky is somehow going to be contaminated or dirty. And the reality is, is you couldn't be further from the truth. And, and in fact, now um, that we've got this toxic element in our house that we're aware of, you know, I might stop flushing toilets here pretty soon. Like we might actually move our entire house over to composting toilets, which we were planning on doing anyways. Um, but that process might get sped up now. Uh, so I'm going to increase the amount of ventilation in my home. I'm going to uh, likely, like I just said, probably move the toilets out of my house. I'm going to install a carbon filter, even though it's not going to be to the level that uh, is recommended, the 10 to 15 minute uh, frequency. I don't want to put in a $3,000 carbon filtration system when I know that the other thing that we're going to do next season is put in a rainwater harvesting system. And so our primary drinking source, our primary showering source is going to be a rainwater harvesting tank. And now that I know that oxygenation is a solution to radon, if we need to use well water, I will move the well water into the rain tank if I run out of water and I will install an aeration system into that rainwater tank so that if I need to gas off radon before the water comes into the house. I can use my rain tank as a, uh, a gassing system uh, to volatilize off that, that radon gas. And so I wanted to do this video today because this is the silent killer. It's the thing that probably a lot of you have in your homes, but you've never thought to think about it. Um, I don't get paid by these guys to talk about their product, uh, so you don't need to worry about uh, me getting a kickback by putting their link up there. Um, I encourage you to check the radon in your house. Um, you can probably um, get one of these and share it amongst your community or your family. Uh, once you've kind of determined um, that you've got it, then you can start to act to fix it. And once you've fixed it, you may want to lend it to your friends or to your community to uh, let them kind of go through the process. Um, this is going to be like it, I've already started the process of testing radon for clients, um, but now I'm going to add this little test uh, for my clients as well to determine whether or not 
they have radon in their well water. <coughs> and uh, as a result of that, it'll change the recommendations that I have for them in terms of whether they consume rainwater uh, or well water. And um, it's even got me thinking about like, you know, if I irrigate my garden, and I, I don't, I'm not too worried about this, but I was thinking about kind of garden irrigation and um, even like broad acre, like center pivot type irrigation, where you've got these massive irrigation systems. Uh, some of them are deriving water from deep underground. And if you're volatilizing um, and atomizing water onto the field, and you're a farmer and you're exposed to those, uh, those large scale atomization irrigation systems, are you getting massive doses of radon as a result of the irrigation that you're doing on your farm? And so is it just as deadly as carbon monoxide or CO2 or whatever high concentration gases are um, occurring in your workplace um, as a result of just not understanding the consequences of removing groundwater? So interesting lesson today. Uh, hopefully you guys learned something from that and uh, you can take this information and put it to productive use uh, in your own home or um, office or wherever you're using well water um, or even just in a space that potentially has access to the earth through the use of a basement. So thanks so much guys. We'll see you in the next video.